Good evening. Thank you so much for being here. It's fantastic to be hosting another big thinking event for Sydney Festival and UTS. I'm Professor Larissa Berent and I've got the Chair of Indigenous Research here at UTS. I'm also a board member of Sydney Festival and UTS Council. And it's my honour to be welcoming you and facilitating this part of this evening's event. But let's begin with the very important ceremony of acknowledgement of country. It seems fitting for us to take a moment to reflect that we are on the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation and in paying our respects to their elders past, present and emerging, we also acknowledge the role, their role in keeping the knowledges of this country and in showing cultural and creative leadership. Our topic today is rethinking leadership in cultural industries, agents of change in a risky world. And our panelists are three creative practitioners who are leading thinkers not just in the creative industries and cultural industries, but have also contributed, I think, to public debate more widely and broadly. So let's get the show on the road. And it's my great pleasure to introduce to you this very formidable and wonderful panel. Um, first of all, I'd like to introduce Alison Whitaker. Uh, Alison is a writer who was awarded the Queensland Premier's Literary Prize for her book of poetry, Black Work. She's also a lawyer who's graduated from Harvard Law School with a master's and she's a senior researcher at the Jumbana Institute here at UTS. Next to Alison, we have Pauline Clegg. Pauline Clegg is an associate professor at UTS. She's the leader of the Cultural Resilience Hub at the Jumbana Institute. She's also a leading Indigenous filmmaker and the founder of the Winder Film Festival. And finally, but last but not least, we have Patricia Cornelius, who's a playwright, novelist and screenwriter. She's a writing icon, a founding member of the Melbourne Workers' Theatre and has been a strong voice for the marginalised in her work. She was among eight international writers to be awarded the Wyndham Campbell Prize. So let's give them a welcome. Now, I started with a very brief bio for each of you because you're, uh, for all of you, your achievements are impressive and we would have been here for the whole hour if I'd read through all of them. But I thought um, I might get each of you really to, in a way, give your, give your own bio and maybe talk a little bit about your own pathway through the creative and cultural industries, the things that have led you to be where you are today. And we might start with you, Patricia. Oh, you have to say shut up with go too long then. Because <laughs> um, I have a, a long, long pathway. Because um, I think I'd have to say that I um, have to thank Whitlam because Whitlam enabled me to go to tertiary onto tertiary education for free and um, and enabled my in my all my siblings that or well, some of my siblings that opportunity and um, I, I accidentally. Um, came across a little, this wonderful idea of theatre um, through becoming a drama teacher at what was called Monash um, Secondary College, a teacher's college. <clears throat> so I uh, had very little knowledge of theatre and I had barely been to it. I, I think I'd been to a neighbour, you know, one of the big numbers, you know, Oklahoma or something, and, and even was delighted by it. But I had no kind of sense of it or, or myself in it. Um, but I was the youngest child and I was a bit of an exhibitionist and so I kind of wanted to be an actor. And I learnt from um, that course there that about we did a lot of theatre and I had really high aspirations of making it big. And um, I uh, very quickly knew that that was a load of crap. I was actually not a very good actor, <laughs> and I can say that now. And um, it, but with sadness in my heart. Um, but there is, there's a sense of uh, uh, that journey led me to think that I can write, and I'll write for the, I'll write for actors instead. I do have a great desire to write just for actors. I love them. Um, but I and then I just uh, kind of did the whole independent theatre number, mostly in Melbourne, um, working with peers, working with small groups, um, working for nothing, uh, 
occasionally getting a job with the arena theatre company and a youth theatre company, occasionally getting a gig every now and then. But um, and it wasn't probably until a company I formed with two other actors called Melbourne Workers Theatre that I actually understood the kind of creative um, track track that I was interested in. And that was a company that was based at Jolly Mott Railway Maintenance Depot. It lasted 25 years. Um, it was a company that talked about class and about race and about uh, Australian workers. And um, it was an apprenticeship for many of us who uh, want, were interested in writing for the theatre. There's a lot of very, very fine playwrights that come out of Melbourne Workers Theatre. And, um, and then I, I sort of continued to mostly write for the independent sector. I'm a huge advocate for it because uh, there's, um, there's some freedom there that, that um, I am very attracted to. There's no money there. And there's an incredible attack on the independent sector in our country, unbelievable attack. And so it's not the most generous of places to be. Um, and I think there's a lot of younger people who think, why don't I fuck off and you know, do something else? Because you know, you, I, you, I absorb um, that area or te that territory maybe too long. But um, it's uh, the, the life force of the art, uh, theatre world in um, Australia, of course. Great, thank you. Pauline, I know your bio, bio is fairly long too, but in your own words, how did you get where you are now? Um, I think I had parents that were activists of the 60s and 70s movement. I was presumed to be, my mother always said that she thought that I could be the first Prime Minister uh, woman of Australia, so I did law. Um, and halfway through law, I watched To Kill a Mockingbird, which is why I thought I was going to do law, uh, and realised that it was the film and not uh, <laughs> law um, <laughs> that I wanted to do. And so I left. My mum disowned me for a year, wouldn't talk to me, and I moved across the world uh, and started to see um, that we were a part of a bigger story, um, uh, that our stories uh, have a natural rhythm that um, I was really lucky when I came back to Australia. I worked with young people um, and could see, and with a lot of old people as well, and could see that there was a different rhythm. Uh, and just by chance, uh, luckily, the Australian Film Commission at the time, now Screen Australia, uh, created the Indigenous branch just as I had finished film school. Um, and so uh, I got to be a part of the first wave of filmmakers uh, that made films that created the sort of iconic Warwick Thorntons and the Rachel Perkins and that era. Um, so I was really lucky to be a part of that. Uh, but I suppose being my mother's daughter, um, I felt that I needed to do stuff that was bigger than just me. Um, and to give back, and so I moved slightly away from storytelling and became more a producer and helped other people tell their stories for a very long time. Um, uh, and it's only in recent years that I've started to move back towards my own writing. Um, and, uh, yeah, this year's probably the year where, I, you know, I worked for Imaginative, uh, the largest Indigenous film festival in the world. It hit its 20-year last year and I stepped down finally after 20 years of giving service to them. I realised that it was a generation of helping another country and their Indigenous voice and that I needed to come back here. And so Winda started four, four or five years ago. Um, and that's why, um, yeah, I suppose I've always felt like there's a balance of uh, understanding the niche that is Indigenous storytelling on the world stage and understanding that it uh, is something that people want to understand, is our story of this world and this country. Um, that we are a part of that tool for this country, uh, but also that the work needs to be done here, and that's why I'm back at UTS. <laughs> Great. We're lucky. Um, and Alison, you're the youngest on the panel, but <laughs> have a bio that would put all of us to shame. Mm -hmm. How did you get here? Yeah, it's, it's a reasonably short 
bio, um, I think. I came into uh, creative industries in maybe a different way, maybe coming into like the third wave now of um, in indigenous storytellers that have uh, institutional support that was denied the people before us. Uh, I came from a family of people who just really knew how to spin a yarn. There was a real theater to kind of um, just going to the dinner table every night. Uh, that kind of impressed upon me, I think, and I always had this curiosity for storytelling uh, and I guess what it could do, uh, the feelings it could invoke in people, the power it had over what they did in their daily lives. Um, and this kind of translated in a teen angsty phase into me writing a lot of um, fiction about uh, what was it, Aboriginal lesbian robots and the Turing test. And I had a lot of people who were willing to sit through me at my worst uh, in order to see something else in me. Um, I went through to go and do a, a law degree here at UTS uh, and ended up in the writing program kind of as a uh, ancillary degree to that. Uh, and what I thought was going to kind of just be a chance to alleviate all the stuff I was learning in law um, actually kind of turned out to be the flip side of the power relationship that I was interested in, in practicing law. And so ever since I've kind of been juggling um, these two careers. Um, but my stumbling into, into poetry as a published poet maybe wasn't as smooth or as intentional um, as we're kind of encouraged to self mythologize about. So uh, it was 2013, uh, I'd run out of um, ab study to cover my rent for the year. Um, and I was effectively going to, to not have an apartment or have a place to stay for the next little bit. Uh, and the Black and Riot Fellowship, which is 10 grand from the State Library of Queensland, um, and I'd encourage everybody to enter if you can, uh, was just such an enticing option. So I had all this poetry that I'd been working on and we just had this cramming session, compressed it all together into a manuscript uh, and it lost that year. But we came back the next year when I had more time to think about it uh, and ended up actually, yeah, getting through and um, under the, the watchful care and supervision um, of Indigenous editors, the collection really flourished. Um, and I found something in there. Um, and that's something that I've always had a troubled relationship. I think sometimes the way that our stories are perceived from outsiders can deprive us of power rather than kind of be a, a, a way of articulating our grievances. But Part of the act of doing poetry and doing defiant art is the, the dignity of speaking out and the dignity of speaking a truth. Lovely. Thank you. Well, our topic this evening is rethinking leadership in cultural industries, agents of change in a risky <laughs> world. So our topic does imply that there are risks in the world that cultural leadership, and I sort of like to use the term cultural and creative interchangeably, cultural leadership and creative leadership has the ability to change. So my next question is, what do you see as those risks and how can this leadership be an agent of change on that issue? And Alison, I might start with you this time. <laughs> I know you were looking at me like, don't start don't with me, do but it. I'm starting with you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, again, part of the risk is that authors and other creatives are never fully in control of their work. Um, I think we have a, a, a very, I speak for poetry, a very authorship-driven model um, of a, assigning credit for creative work. Um, but actually, the role of the individual creative is quite small, but they're conferred most of the public risk. So part of handing over a collection to an editor, for instance, means um, surrendering them to a great degree of trust about meaning making and how you want to convey um, something that you want to get across. And part of that relationship of trust has not always been honoured, I think. Uh, and it goes far beyond that too, to distribution and audience seeking and very real market pressures that influence the kind of stories that we're allowed to tell and the kind of stories that ultimately become successful. Okay. Pauline? Mm. <clears throat> oh, there's so many. I mean, it's really hard because, you know, filmmaking is a community. Mm. You can't do... I mean, you probably could if you're Ivan Sen, because um, he's such a, you know, um, visionary in the way that he does his films. Um, but a lot of filmmakers need other people to make their, their vision come true. And so it's really hard sometimes to, um, you know, when we first started in this industry, we'd never heard the Indigenous voice on screen before. And so the power was... Um, really openly given to all of us as filmmakers to express the way we wanted to express. Um, and I think uh, 
when that power became, got awards and got well known and all that kind of stuff, the crunching of that voice started happening. And I think that's where we're at at the moment. We're um, about to hit probably a new wave of a generation that's coming up and, um, and we need to be aware of not crushing that cultural voice and not sort of kind of disrupting the stuff that needs to be disrupted, <laughs> you know? We have to um, take risks, we have to be brave. Um, we have to think about um, whether we're the broadcaster, the filmmaker, um, the, the distributor, that there is opportunities for our people to see the many voices of our nations. I think that at this point we keep on getting told that Indigenous is one voice. And we have to remind ourselves that there are different ways and different approaches that have to be made for the 500 nations of this country. Um, and that is something that I think we battle with a little bit each day mm -hmm. with how to deal with that and also how to deal with trauma. I mean, I think working at UTS, um, we do... As Indigenous people, we often do the hard stories that have to be told about our communities, the barrel stories, the, you know, the deaths in custody. Um, and they are taxing for Indigenous filmmakers to do, but they have to be done. Uh, and so how to respect them with the right amount of aptitude and the right amount of um, you being able to walk away at the end of the day so that you don't take on that trauma yourself as a filmmaker is something that I'm very aware of in this day and age. Mm. And Patricia? I, th I think it's hard not to be just a great big whinger all, all, uh, all the time, but you know, what I'm really whinging about in terms of the theatre industry is just the uh, sort of how most of the small and middle range companies have be, have met their demise and and it's taken a while um, but when Brandis took the money mostly from the independent sector and to set up a kind of double dipping um, place for with catalyst I think it's called and um, and without any consultation, that had a huge impact on on the theatre industry, and it's and it sort of still is. And so you, you kind of think about the leadership in terms of uh, uh, where where where's the heat in in the kind of stories that are being told, and where 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 is it got the surprise attacks that are, that come and. Um, and it used to be it used to be from small companies who were kind of living off the doll, and that's almost impossible now. Um, who we find a space who would collaborate together and create, and the same with all, all forms of art really. But theatre in particular had this sort of audacity and and were about telling stories that because the, the the artists got together and had a hunger for it, and I feel fear. That kind of, and that, that leadership is odd. That's a sort of sitting, um, gurgling away and creating a, an expertise in, the, in our art form um, that is sort of really uh, lacking now. We don't get enough chance to put our plays on. We don't get enough chance to put them on again or, or to um, work um, to, towards the next one because it, it, it's so uh, spasmodic and, and uh, random. Um, so where, where's the leadership? Uh, certainly not with the mainstream companies. They're sitting pretty, and um, they sometimes do great work and mostly do boring work. And um, but they they um, they don't have any kind of things. Sometimes I go to those theatres and I think I've got nothing to do with any of this. I don't have any kind of connection to it um, because it's not just that used to be. Um, now it's more and more that's what young people and, or new playwrights are aspiring to. That's the mecca. Well, it never was for me and it, and it, it, and it shouldn't be. It should be about uh, finding works that are dramatically powerful and new and great voices. Because it's also that idea of what is success, right? Mm -hmm. Because for the way in which the government is funding stuff at the moment, success is the amount of money that's in your bank accounts. Um, and, and I think that's hard then for those of us that have to write or have to do film. Um, my idea of success is the amount of voices that I get into this industry in the next 
20 years. Um, so, I, you know, I'm always going to be up against a government that about how to get my funding to make the films that I make. Mm-hmm. Same, probably the same with you in theatre. Yeah. I'm going to dig into each of your body of work a little bit more, but before I do, I'm just going to ask each of you who are the creative and cultural leaders that have most inspired you or had the biggest impact. And I was going to ask you, Pauline, while you're looking up at the sky, uh, if you could answer first. Uh, Obviously, my mother and my aunties. Uh, There's a strong force up on the north coast of matriarchs uh, that tell me... uh, I've. I left NITB about six years ago and they still ring me because my credit comes up on NITB and they tell me everything about the films and why I should have done it differently or whatever. So, um, (laughs) you know, I love that about them. Uh, But I was really privileged at the start of my career to have um, the people like the Gary Foley, Justine Saunders, Bob Mazza, Uncle Lester Bostock, Jerry Bostock, uh, the pioneers of the black theatre moving into the basically black era, um, sort of kind of surrounded all of us young ones when we first came in. Wal Saunders was the original person at the uh, AFC's Indigenous unit and he just backed us um, at that time. And there were so many of those filmmakers and actors from that era that saw these young upshot filmmakers sort of like come out of the film school saying we're going to break down all the barriers in the world um, and uh, and they gave us the support by being the actors in the films and the rest of it so um, I owe it to a lot of them. Mm. Patricia? I'm a, I'm a sort of old, old school and mostly sort of initially about acting and I sort of think someone like Grotowski and is a Polish director who uh, absolutely devoted his life to co- creating a, a style of acting about the, the four actors that was very actorly, very disciplined, and very much about expressing um, in a non naturalistic way. And I think that was such an eye opener. It's also once I, when I was really young, I came to Sydney and I saw Lindsay Kemp's um, our, uh, Lady of our, of our Flowers, Lady of Our Flowers, I think, and uh, Jean Genet work. And it blew my brains out because it, there was, uh, it was so uh, working on a, a essential level, on a, on a, 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 a um, very uh, image-based and, and absolutely reliant on how the actor and the actor's body. It, it sort of breaks my heart when you go to work to plays and they're really fine plays and you watch the actor and they're dead from the, the mouth down, you know, the, or from the chin down. And they're not, there's, no, there's no employment of them in, to express in, in the way... I, I, I sort of still love it. I love the physicality and the, the corniness of that. I have to say, you know, there, there is absences in um, playwriting for women in Australia, really huge absences and shameful ones because they just couldn't sustain a, um, a, a, life, a life with the, the, this um, um, industry. And, but I, I think Dorothy Hewitt was incredible. <laughs> Dorothy, sorry. <laughs> the, the very important... Um, is that, am I speaking? Can you hear me? Um, yeah, Dorothy Hewitt was sort of just a, a sort of fabulous for young playwrights to know that there was a, a woman who um, who wrote in a, a, a quite non-naturalistic way, politically, um, was about class, um, and she existed. So, uh, and then today there are so many fabulous young playwrights, uh, Nakia Louis and. Um, Jada Alberts is really, you know, creating fabulous and wonderful um, form of theatre as well and a story. Um, yeah, and Melissa Reeves, you know, lots of really fabulous playwrights. Alison. We're spoiled at the moment, I think, for sources of inspiration in Indigenous literature. Um, Melissa Lukashenko just absolutely took out prize after prize with too much lip uh, last year, and I really encourage you all to to go out and read it and engage with it. Um, But part of the, the fundamental fun of this movement is that Indigenous peoples are beginning to be able to uh, 
get platforms in the industry to talk about things other than the, the stereotypical Indigenous stories that we're usually invited to tell. So something that was really inspiring for me to look at as a young writer is to see writers who've been doing this for generations. So uh, Uncle Lionel Fogarty's poetry, um, kind of going over it for the first time, was a, a revelation to be able to write things that were angry and odd and confrontational from kind of the traditional canon of Western in poetry and to be able to see that your tongue didn't have to do all this weird uh, snaking around the conventions of the English language in order to produce something beautiful and powerful. Um, but also to see uh, a growing body of uh, queer Indigenous writers being able to write uh, authentically um, and in a complex and nuanced way about their experiences. So Ellen Van Nierven uh, comes to mind, um, as well as uh, more provocative poets that are kind of willing to merge scholarship uh, with their poetry and creative practice, like Evelyn Araluen. Um, we're so spoiled, I could just list off names forever. <laughs> What's well, good? Keep getting you inspired. You'll keep writing, uh, Patricia. The anthem is one of the highlights of Sydney Festival. One of the two C shows. It revisits Who's Afraid of the Working Class, and I thought we just might start by getting you to perhaps give a bit of an overview of what you were seeking to say with that work and what the impact has been with Who's Afraid. Yeah. yeah. Um, Who's Afraid? Well, I think it was uh, twenty years ago or something. Um, but it was, a, 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 it was a, about four, five of us, uh, four playwrights and a composer, who wrote Who's Afraid, and it was an incredibly um, terrifying experience because it was the first time that I'd ever worked in collaboration with another playwright, with other playwrights, and it was a kind of very experimental in that sense, but was also was fuelled by a, a very shared and passionate hatred of Jeff Kennett. And so we were um, in a really dreadful, dreadful state in Victoria with Kennett. And, you know, people used to laugh about being Jeffed. But it was sort of, it was quite true that he was very controlling of the arts. He was quite, he was the arts minister as well as the premier. And he, he was, um, we, there was a kind of depressed state uh, from, hi from him, strange, he's, you know, going on to, anyway. Um, so that, that was sort of, it was sort of a fabulous work because we didn't know what would happen, but um, it, 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 and all, to having those voices come together and, um, uh, and not uh, repeat each other or, or not uh, uh, compete with each other, it, it felt, a terrific process, so great to have the chance to go again with Anthem. So is, it, is Anthem a, a revisiting? Is it a, a new conversation? How do, you, how do you see the two works No, it, it's together? sort of... Well, it is a revisit in the sense that... Uh, the, this is the Melbourne Workers Theatre production um, initially with um, Who's Afraid, and um, with Anthem, it was sort of absolutely revisiting our kind of... Uh, let, let's look at how there's so much attention in terms of um, uh, uh, gender politics or, um, and look at how class gets forgotten and how class is sort of a fundamental and miserable um, thing in the arts where, where you kind of either it's uh, represented in a sentimental clawing way or it's um, not represented at all and usually what you see in the theatre is the, oh, the, the, oh this, uh, this is how we live on bullshit but you know that we just kind of accept it but, um, but so there, it was a kind of totally t different stories and a different intention but the class thing was really important to each of us and it is a collaboration. So I wonder if you could talk to us a little bit about how you approached that collaboration. Yeah. Well, I think a lot of people think that we all sit around and write together. Oh, that's a good line. <laughs> but we actually go away and I, I, it sort of still stuns me. I, kind of, I have no analysis of how um, that the, each of us don't kind of come back and go, oh, I've written about that. So that we somehow naturally that we each have our own um, your kind of interest and, and it is all said on a train or most of it is said on a train. And so there is a sense of people moving in, through the city and, um, 
And I, I don't know if you know Melbourne, but there are certain lines, and I'm sure there are in Sydney, that are very famous for um, you know, the most unbelievable kind of drama on the, that happen in the... I sometimes have my sunglasses and my book. <laughs> because you go, whoa! And uh, in most of those things you can't even put in a play because they're way too uh, unreal. But, um, so, yeah, we, we come together to read our work. Um, we used to have a really old thing of uh, when someone having an idea and if we held our pens and we'd put our pens down <laughs> quietly so you could a shortcut saying, you know, being apologetic about why you didn't like the idea, just everybody put their pen down and you knew. <laughs> <laughs> right, I let that one go. So, uh, yeah, so we're, we're quite um, blunt with each other and easy with each other. Um, and then Irini uh, Vella is a musician, uh, both a musician and a, a composer and writer. She, she threads all, all the stories through with this gorgeous... You talked a bit about one of the central themes about class, but I was wondering if you could talk to us a bit about what you're hoping audiences will take away from, from Anthem. What are the sorts of conversations you're really hoping to spark with it? I think it's sort of interesting listening to Pauline. It's about those stories that aren't told, and it's sort of extra, extraordinary, the stories that aren't told, because why, why the fuck not? Because yeah, they're absolutely so powerful. They're so threaded with really extraordinary historical contemporary meat. You know, stuff that really can just sit, get you going, like, well, which is exactly what theatre... You, you want people to be contested. You want people to be threatened by ideas. You, to kind of the worst thing, they oh, I enjoyed that, let's wear to get a drink. You know, that's the, the level of conversation most of the time when you leave the theatre. And to be kind of... Even if you, even if you feel threatened yourself... There's something exciting about that because there, there's something being contested. That's theatrical. And there, there is... Um, uh, I don't know, I've lost my plot. I've lost my point. There, there, what was I saying for? What were you asking? <laughs> I was asking you what you hoped audiences oh, would audience. take away and the conversations oh, they'd so, have. I was hoping that you'd just get really passionate about it and get lost like I just did. So. <laughs> I don't, yeah, I'm, I'm hoping. I, you know, I don't, I've sort of get, given up on the idea that theatre is a revolutionary tool, but I kind of <laughs> like the idea that it aggravates, that it that it scratches away, that even if it doesn't last, that there's a point in your, the, your, when you're sitting there that you kind of go, I I, I feel um, I have to rethink something. Just. Slightly. But don't you feel like there's a bit of a revolt? Because I love going to the theatre. Do you feel like there's a little bit of a revolt against all of these cuts that we've had over the last couple of years in the arts and that you're starting to see some of that? Sorry, Larissa. That <laughs> some of that happening yeah. of the sort of kind of the brazen sort of kind of theatre coming back out again? I, no, I, I do. Mm. I don't mean, yeah, I, I shouldn't be so mean to... That might be just in Sydney. But, <laughs> no, I think that, it, that, of course, there's always works that were... But I, I, I still feel like... I, I guess I think, if you know, like the gender thing, when I, and when all of a sudden we realised that there were no female playwrights being put, put on in main venues or anywhere, actually, and then so you kind of uh, think that... But I actually remember in the 80s there was a... A, a, a surge up against that gender inequity. And it, sometimes it feels like um, unless companies take on the policies um, that, in a really fundamental way, I, I really fear that it'll slip away from us again. Mm. It's like that, that stuff of, um, with, with Indigenous theatre in Melbourne quite a number of years ago, and then there was a sort of like, been there, done that. Mm. And you, no, you haven't. And, it, mm. it, it, but, and same with um, gender. We're back. We're back. You know, women are back in particular. And it's like, I just think, God, take advantage, because it might not last. Mm. You know, it really might not. I seize the day. Yeah, seize the day. <laughs> um, Alison, obviously you, you work both in the law and, and in policy as well as in the creative industries. And I was wondering, actually, to get your thoughts on the sort of law reform work that you are just as passionate about as you are about your poetry. And I was wondering if you could talk about 
um, any changes you might have seen to systemic and entrenched racism? And does, in, in a sense of trying to discover where you've got hope that we can be agents of change? Because you've mm -hmm. worked in some pretty tough spots. Yeah, that's true. Um, so I'm going to take the first part of your question about what kind of <laughs> transformations I've seen. Um, I was kind of spent a really long time um, looking for hope in the crevices of settler law. Um, and it's a difficult thing to do because uh, it's a, a tool that not only at the level of like what it does, does us wrong, but in the act of how it goes about doing it as well. So how do you turn a tool like that um, back on itself? Uh, while I was uh, in the States, um, I kind of just became embroiled in this moment that was happening there, um, being in 2017 and kind of dealing with the post-Trump hangover, um, about hopelessness and the, the, the radical framework of hopelessness, about what um, it means when we can be kind of unshackled from that. So uh, it's a bit hypocritical on one side because obviously um, I have been enormously advantaged by the black fellas before me who worked really hard to ensure that I had simple things like freedom of movement that my grandfather didn't have, um, the freedom to uh, effectively in some small way govern my own life um, as a, a formally equal liberal citizen um, and the chance to kind of fight for particular scraps. I accept that those were really hard fought out um, and that... It, had I not had them, I might feel quite differently. But the idea that I was introduced to in the States is um, one introduced by Derek Bell, the first uh, black professor at Harvard Law School, uh, that of interest convergence and Afro-pessimism, that racism in the law especially doesn't tend to change, it just tends to change its shape. Um, and that can explain how, despite you know, numerous pivots in Indigenous policy, we kind of seem to not get anywhere because all that changes is the language and the method of administration, not actually a meaningful shift in power, uh, which is a depressing thing to kind of accept. Um, but I think that there's a hope in that, in accepting that this forum isn't necessarily always going to work for us. Um, and so we can begin to work within the law or without the law in ways that are less simple than winning or losing um, that are about actually thinking about what we achieve through the work that we do. And I think that goes for creative work as well. You have done work on uh, constitutional issues and also on treaty. What are the potentials for those things for change? Um, I mean, obviously they're not happening in New South Wales and I have no authority to talk about other treaty processes that are going on. Um, but I think they require a, a demonstration of good faith um, and a requirement that the relationship keep rolling on. That's, um, the, I guess, the feedback that's coming from places that have treaty processes that are already being engaged. So that you can't separate governmental policy from the fact that the government wants to set up an agreement uh, with a native nation or an indigenous nation. Um, and we just have to look kind of overseas um, to any other, um, I guess, part of the Anglosphere jurisdictions that have similar relationships with indigenous people to see what a treaty um, or a constitutional reform means. Um, and that we're on, we have to deal with the, the tricky question of uh, enforcement uh, and self-determination, which are kind of always lingering in the background. Mm. Obviously, as First Nations people, country's always been really important to us, but I think given the tragic events over the summer, I think mm. the issue of the climate crisis is now something that's come to the fore for all Australians. Um, Alison, I was wondering how you think creative and cultural leadership should be approaching the, co the climate crisis? Yeah. Again, this is not a very I ask hopeful... You all the easy questions. What was that? I ask you all the easy questions. Oh. <laughs> Yeah. Again, it's not, um, it's not a nice thing to say. I think um, arts has a, a limited potential um, of making change uh, in the current climate crisis that we're experiencing. Others may have a different opinion. I'm just feeling especially pessimistic at the moment. But um, it's, it's hard to, to reach and engage people. Um, and I guess the other paradox of it is the tools that we have for talking to people about 
catastrophes on a, a global scale or on a massive scale that go kind of beyond what people can observe in their immediate vicinity is that traditional media literacy tools don't work. There's evidence that traditional media literacy tools actually um, generate conspiracy theories and frameworks like QAnon. It's so hard to kind of meet people where they're at with what we have right now. Um, and assuming that forces of truth-telling, beauty and art-making are going to be kind of what gets us over the threshold rather than kind of being really deliberate and concrete in our political demands um, to survive. Did you want to add anything, your thoughts around leading? cultural leadership, creative leadership in the climate crisis. It's, it's an issue that affects us all. I think um, because especially in the Indigenous space, um, in the arts, Mother Earth plays a very big role in the work that we do. Mm -hmm. And so uh, with the effect of what she is going through and we are going through by being the caretakers on top of her at the moment and the effects of it, that there will have to be uh, conversations and different ways of telling story from here on in uh, because we're not listening to the land well enough or we're not giving that space within the arts for us to show what the new ways of, or it may be old ways, they were probably around for about 60,000 years, these new ways of telling story, um, that the trauma... Um, can be healed in, a, in different ways by using methods of arts and um, nurturing um, the soul uh, to... We see the strength of resilience and we see the strength of our communities sort of kind of coming up out of the ashes, it's terrible to say. Um, but uh, with that comes a lot of beauty as well um, and a lot of resilience and a lot of strength and how do we... Um, tell the beats of the story as it comes through because sometimes it's going to be hard. And so how do we find those methods to place um, the right energy around some of that stuff because it, it's going to affect communities in a big way. And sometimes you're going to need to show the, the disaster <laughs> in a big way and be angry and, you know, uh, throw a couple of chairs around as you do this new journey of whether it's, you know, art or whatever. Mm -hmm. But I think there's, um, yeah, there's, there's stuff that we need to learn from the new ways of telling story or old ways of telling story, which, you know, I think is the stuff that I'm really interested in mm -hmm. deciphering down and figuring out why our beats of storytelling are different in Australia. What is the difference? And... Um, Sadly, once you, when you come down to a base of an incident like this, you can see how the beats create themselves afterwards. Um, so it's my time to sort of kind of observe a lot, really, and uh, see where the shines are. I was actually, in a way, my next, my first question, she was almost a follow-up to that because um, I was interested with your ability to have seen Indigenous storytelling around Australia with the work you've done, particularly the mentoring of, of a whole genera generations now, um, although you're so young, generations of Indigenous filmmakers, but then also the work you've done internationally with Indigenous filmmakers. I was wondering how you would articulate the power of Indigenous storytelling. Um, <clears throat> oh, it's so hard. I think it's more about... How do we, I, I hear it so much in the academic space where, um, you know, a lot of people talk about decolonising and um, I think what I find really exciting, uh, and I make up words, so excuse me, um, but is indigenifying the space. Um, we didn't get colonised. I don't think that the way in which we tell stories is still the old way that... Uh, we learnt it from grandfathers and grandmothers and aunts and uncles sitting around campfires on a Friday night with the uncle in the shadows trying to scare us as that grandfather told us the stories. You know, like, I have so many ways of hearing the beats of the storytelling from my childhood um, that are not about me decolonising because it wasn't colonised in the way that they told that story. And so how do we respect the fact that we have been telling those stories in the right way, in different beat structures. What are those beat structures? How can we 
shackle up or empower up the next generation to say, you don't have to write to um, the beat that you are being told by one pattern, that in actual fact, the diversity of our nations is about respecting the way in which uh, the different people tell stories. It's all right to have a five-act structure in an Indigenous storytelling landscape. It's just that you may not get funded the way that... And so my way of doing it is to write about those changes and say, you know, um, you know in, in the same way as archetypes are really different now for me. Um, you know, I've started to write Indigenous archetypes because the archetypes of Jung and all of those sort of kind of specialised archetypes that we've all been writing to for so long don't fit the motivations of my characters as Indigenous peoples. And so how do I shift that? How do I move that? And so I write them, I make, I make them work for the characters of, that I've watched. I mean, I do watch 500 films that are made by Indigenous people a year. Um, I'm very lucky to be surrounded by Indigenous work constantly. Um, and so I see my world sometimes a little bit different to not just watching you know, um, the blockbusters. Um, and I can see that there's a need in our country to validate the different ways of telling story. We are talking about agents of change in a risky world, and I was wondering if you maybe had an example or an anecdote or some experience of a time when you have seen the profound change that can come from Indigenous storytelling. Um... I think it was more about watching people try to analyse um, Samson and Delilah when Warwick's film came out and people were trying to analyse his works. And they're like, the character doesn't move with a motivation. What's going on? And a lot of um, non-Indigenous people were looking at his work not figuring out that Mother Earth was a protagonist in the film. And as soon as you said that to them, and you talked about, you know, you know, when Mother Earth wraps the young girl, she makes the decision to get out of that position. And they were like, what do you mean she hugs her? Or like, you, you know, like when the Earth covers her, when she goes into the ground. And it was these light bulb moments in people around Australia just like going, oh, there's a different way of looking at the way in which their films are being made. And it was an appreciation um, for the next couple of films that came out by Indigenous filmmakers, that the rhythm and, and some of the concepts might be a little bit different to what we're used to in Australia. Uh, and I think if we were truthful enough to have those conversations in Australia, we could start having better conversations about what's happening in our country and what is our identity in this country today. Now, finally, I thought I'd ask each of you what you've learned about the process of being an agent of change through your own work that you would share with other practitioners, particularly younger, early career practitioners. And I might start with you, Alison. Yeah, just think about your audience. I, th I think um, one of the crucial tensions that we have uh, in the moment that we're experiencing now is trying to imagine a generalised public that we're talking to in our art, when really that public has never really existed, but if it was ever going to exist, it certainly wouldn't be today. Um, and to think about how fragmented um, that audience is, um, and to think about what it means if you're um, an artist who's working for change to have a fragmented audience, um, and to think about what's realistically going to move them, not just to feel things, not just to feel sad or to pity you or to think that they're a good person, but actually to do something. Pauline? Um, understand that everyone has a voice to tell and, uh, and that uh, no one's story is not valid. I think that we have a lot of our young people believing that um, uh, they don't have freedom of thought in this country and that's dangerous for our next generation to not feel like their voice is being heard. Um, and that's where I spend most of my energy, is trying to lift their voice uh, without the pretense of constraint around it. Mm. And Patricia? I think that I, it's like, just don't get stuck. 
so so many um, young or new playwrights are, uh, have a work and they're, they're, it's very precious and they can't get it on through the main through the mainstream and um, so and they keep waiting for the chance for the mainstream to kind of uh, give them the nod and it won't happen and in a way you have to kind of seek out collaborators, you have to seek out people and uh, cheap venues, places, just get it on no, no matter where it is, just get it on so you can move on and that you don't have this precious manuscript forever mm. sort of hanging there. I wonder too, I mean, we've spoken a lot this evening about uh, cuts to funding, um, harder to get um, uh, theatre projects up, harder to get film projects up in that environment. And I was wondering, I mean, you obviously all still are very optimistic about the areas that you're working in, and maybe as a bit of a follow-up to advice to give to people, um, what would you, uh, how, how would you encourage people to think about having um, a career in the creative industries or contributing to um, our cultural and creative life? So maybe I'll start with you, Pauline. Look, at the end of the day, you have to do what's passionate for you to stick to. Um, I've, you know, it's a hard industry. It's, um, and we all know it and we all <laughs> struggle through it. Um, and we're often doing stuff for three, for free, for community, because that's what you have to do. Uh, but I wouldn't have it any other way. And the day I lose my passion is the day I'll step out of the industry. What about you, Patricia? You've had a long career and it keeps on going, what's your advice? Yeah, I, I, occasionally I would think I'm going to do something else and, and then I'd think I'm so unqualified <laughs> that I've got, I've got no other skills. <laughs> and so uh, you go back in and I, I think the same. I, it, it, as much as it's hard, and, a, and it always has been, mm. it, there's, there is something so um, delightful about when, when something works when, you, when you, you hit something that, and you know that it's got resonance and you know that it's important. I, I guess I think if you've got the chance to, to write something and someone wants to do something with it, make sure it says something. Go, might as well go for it. Just go for it. Because that's the delight, is that you, even if it doesn't push very far. Can you be Hi. my script editor on my next one? <laughs> 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 We're already starting more collaborations. <laughs> what about you, Alison? Yeah, I think the important thing is to remember that you're a full person. I think with the growing pressure in the arts industry, there's a tendency for a lot of people to overwork themselves to the point of burnout, um, but also to live lives that are so singularly focused on their craft that their craft becomes boring because they don't know anything else. Um, so live an embarrassing, scandalous life and get the material out of it. Well, that's advice we can all take away. Now, be, just as we're finishing up this part of the forum today and I, we move into the salon and uh, I hand over to uh, Professor Susan Page, I just wanted to make a note of a couple of things. Um, one was just, just give a thanks to the production team at UTS and Sydney Festival for putting to get today together. Um, and to remind you that Anthem is on from the 15th to the 19th of January at the Roslyn Packer Theatre in Walsh Bay. So hopefully you're going to run down and uh, see that after hearing the discussion tonight. There are two more forums. What defines a project as, as First Nations is here on the 18th of January at 2 p.m. and Rethinking Nationalism on the 25th of January at 4 p.m. and you can get more details on the Sydney Festival website. So can you join me in thanking our exceptional panellists once again, Alison Whitaker, <laughs> Associate Professor Pauline Quaid and Patricia Cornelius.